she was beaten severely. She was beaten with a claw hammer, she was beaten with a baseball bat. A brutal killing. You hear of, you know, crimes of passion. This goes beyond that. A dark mystery with multiple suspects. She knew where she was gonna be, at what time, when she'd be back. When you start owing drug dealers money, people start getting desperate and start getting violent. Somewhere in that weird web, we got a murderer. And now we just gotta figure out who. The truth will be revealed. Somehow or another, somebody's gotta answer for this. Every day in North America, dozens of people are murdered. The key to solving the toughest of these homicides lies in the final 24 hours of the victim's life. To crack the case, detectives must reconstruct that critical timeline. The minutes and hours containing evidence that can help unlock the mystery and catch the killer. Grovetown, Georgia, just outside Augusta. It's known as a safe place to raise a family. Grovetown is starting to grow a little bit, kind of as Augusta's bedroom community. It's kind of a nice little pocket. Your average, you know, middle class working families. Everyone seems to know everyone. Uh, everyone's friendly. You wouldn't really lock your doors. But that sense of security can be dangerously misleading. Emergency 911. Yes, I'm over here at uh, Cold Springs. The back door's broke in, and I had to come over here to do some work, and uh, I called the owner. I mean, I, I hollered at the door, uh -huh. and I did, did no response. All right, I'll get them on over there. The patrol units that responded when they arrive at the scene, within short order, they start seeing blood not too far inside, you know, the back door. My supervisor had told me we had an assault and they needed me at the scene right away. The victim is identified as 41-year-old Kay Parsons. <laughs> When I arrived, Kay was already on her way to the hospital. They didn't know if she was gonna live or not. They've already got the scene taped off, a of crime scene tape. Lead investigator Jimmy Edmonds and his partner Brian Jones begin investigating the grisly crime. Well, I can see the pool of blood where she was at. She was beaten severely. You can see there was a struggle that took place in the foyer that led into the living room. And then you could tell it went out into the garage. There was a bloody baseball bat next to her. And we also located a bloody claw hammer underneath her car. When you think of a hammer and a baseball bat being used, you start thinking of, this is personal. It's not like a, a knife or a gunshot. Or, this is a up close and personal beating. When you talk about brutality, that's one thing. But this was overkill. Their first task is to locate her next of kin. I was able to get a number for David Parsons, her husband. I made contact with him. He was in Los Angeles, California on business. Obviously, he was very concerned about his wife. I had to explain it to him on the phone, um, which is very tough. He immediately got on an airplane and flew home. You could tell he was distraught. 
he told the doctor to take her off life support. Their case is now a homicide. Investigators must reconstruct the last 24 hours of Kay's life to uncover who had reason to commit such a brutal murder. You have to start trying to figure out where was she, what was she doing, who was she talking to? Did she have any problems with anybody? I mean, did any arguments happen here recently? She was you know, always friendly with everybody, but she pretty much lived for her son. When you have a death, um, and especially kind of a who done it right off, you know, right from the get go, then everybody becomes suspect. You want to talk to the spouse. You know, it's going to give you some good information to see if there's any problems or anybody has a motive to hurt her. Time's ticking, so you know I, I've got to ask them some hard questions and find out about you know their their family life. You know, are they having problems? With the type of personal crime that this was, it could have easily been something. It could have been family related. David says he last spoke to Kay at 6.45 p.m., the night before she was attacked, and had been unable to reach his wife by phone all morning. He gave me no indication of any marital problems. He said, you know, they were in love. They were high school sweethearts. Everything is just peach pie, just just wonderful. He'd been in California for a couple of days, so I knew it wasn't him that committed the crime. I asked him if Kay had any problems with anybody, if he, anybody he could think of that would possibly do this, and he, he said, absolutely not. You still have to figure out, you know, what the motivation is for Kay to be dead. With so many unanswered questions, their hope rests in Kay's timeline. You can't look at a body and go, OK, yeah, that 3.05 PM is when that, you know, it doesn't work that way. Basically, the frame of reference comes down to who's the last person that talked to him. Kay Parsons was very predictable. She would get the kids off to school, then come back. She had her daily routine. We learned. Kay left and took her son to school. On the way to school, they stopped and got some fast food for breakfast. She then took him to the school, dropped him off. We were able to verify that through the principal and teachers that were outside. We found the fast food bag and the, and the coffee cup on the floor. We could go back to that place um, to see, you know, to get a timeline of where she was at. They learn that Kay purchased the food items at 6.55 a.m. This establishes a two-hour window until she is discovered. When you're working backwards from the death, OK, who found them? A lot of people assumed that it was the contractor who was at the house that may have done this. What was he doing there? He just happened to stumble upon it. Was that just a happenstance come by that day? Did he have a schedule to come by? We interviewed uh, Mr. Cozart to find out everything that took place. What were you doing over there? What did you see when you got there? What were you supposed to be there to do? He said he was supposed to come there and finish doing some work on the back door. Cozart tells police he started the repair the previous afternoon and returned at 8.45 AM to finish the job. When he arrived, he knocked on the door, didn't get an answer. He called several times, didn't get an answer. So he went to the backyard to look at the back door where he was doing his work at. I just opened the gate and I walked in. And I seen the glass all over the um, patio, and I said, hmm, this don't look good. And I walked up, and I hollered, said, hey, is anybody in there? He got no response. And that's when he dialed 911. And I said, something bad has happened over here. He also claims, before arriving at Kay's house, he was on another job site. 
So did he have enough time to do all that stuff and then stage it and then go and change and make sure all this stuff was right and, and then come back? Oh, I happened to find this. Investigators look to confirm his whereabouts earlier that morning. Mr. Kozart was very forthcoming, answered all our questions. He would, you know, gave no indication he was trying to hide anything. We were able to clear him. He was just there to do his job, and he happened to find this awful crime that had been committed. But he does provide detectives with an important lead. He said that when he came back around front and was calling 911. Then I seen that boy sitting, the next door neighbor sitting down on a rock across the street. And uh, that made me kind of suspicious right there. Just sitting there. This person asked Mr. Cozart, he said, you know, tell them my, my house has been broken into as well, which was the house right next door. I found it very interesting. So of course, wanted to find out where he'd been and why he was there or why he was across the street. The young man is identified as Kay's neighbor, 22-year-old Michael Bowers, whose claim appears to be true. So now that we've got that second house that's been broken into and signs of a burglary and blood on the back door jam. And that blood ended up being Kay's blood. So as an investigator, you, you got to sit back and think, well, if you are a criminal, a burglar, if you just break into somebody's house and beat this woman eventually to death, are you going to leave and go break into the house next door and hang around to get caught? That doesn't make any sense. I had my suspicions about Michael and why, why he was there. Detectives need to speak with Kay Parsons' neighbor, Michael, who they believe may know something about her shocking murder. You got Michael sitting out there that all of a sudden is just there, kind of out of the blue, with this going on. As police question Michael, his mother, Becky Sears, and her younger son, Christopher, turn up. Becky was concerned about her friend Kay. Looking for insight into how Michael may be involved, they examine the relationship between the two houses. From the minute that David and Kay moved next door to Becky and her husband, they became immediate friends. They did everything together. Their sons played together. They had couples tennis, couples vacations. They were inseparable. You could see the close relationship that they had with one another, almost like sisters. Becky tells police about the last time she saw Kay. Becky and, and Kay being friends like they were, they knew each other's routines like, like clockwork. Becky, she said she left that morning to take her kids to school. Um, she told us that she saw Kay backing out of her driveway. She said she drove to the daycare, dropped her youngest child off, and then drove to the school and dropped her other children off, and then left from there and went to work. Becky says she returned home as soon as she got the call from her son, Michael. Michael was there at the time that the contractor found all of this, so he happened to be out front. Now we've got that time frame to work with. Detectives need to uncover what Michael was up to. As an investigator, I don't believe in coincidences. Certainly in homicide investigations, there's no such thing as coincidence. There's a reason why things happen. We took him back to, to our office and conducted an interview with him uh, to find out you know, what his story was. Michael had a troubled past. He'd been arrested a few times. He told us that he left the house that morning to go do a painting job with somebody. Uh, come to find out there was no painting job he was going to do. He was lying about the whole thing. If you lie about your whereabouts, they're going to check that. If you lie about your timeline, they're going to check that. If you lie about who you were with, they're going to verify that. They're going to check everything. Caught in his lie, Michael offers up a new story. 
He said he walked over to a friend's house and pretty much hung out there for a while until his mother left, and then he walked back home. Obviously, he didn't want to get in trouble with his mother um, because he told her he was going to do a painting job. He called his mother at work and told her that their house had been broken into, but didn't call 911. Detectives looked to place him inside Kay's house that morning. In the back door, the way it was shattered, I mean, there was tiny shards of glass everywhere. So I asked Michael to let me see the bottom of his shoes. And as I looked at the bottom of his shoes, I see a tiny shard of glass stuck in the bottom of the shoe. So I was like, well, was he in the house? We sent the glass off to the crime lab, and it came back that it was glass from the case back door. His explanation was that once the handyman had told him that the house had been broken into, he walked around back and looked inside. And he said that's how he got the glass in his shoe. Michael's only hope lies in his alibi. He tells police his friend, Anthony, can vouch for him. Anthony also had some problems with drugs. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, did Michael owe people money for drugs? You know, you start getting in that drug world and you start owing people money, they start doing things to your house, to your family. People start getting desperate and start getting violent. Police bring Anthony in for questioning. He said that he'd come over in the morning. Told him I had an appointment at 9 o'clock. I guess that's why he decided to come by so damn early. But that's pretty damn early, dude. He lied to y'all and said that we were going to go looking for work. Yep. And the friend's like, yeah, he was here all the way up until this point right here, and I had to go to work. I'm telling you the truth. He was with me, and we were in that house. At 827, dude, you got to go. I got to go. Ultimately, if him being with me is exonerating him, I'm sorry, but it's the truth, dude. I'm not going to stick up for Michael, but I'm not going to lie on him either. Michael, did he have enough time to get home, do this, stage it, clean up, and then be out front when the contractor happened to pull up? Michael's departure from Anthony's house at 8.30 AM leaves a 15-minute window to walk the mile home and attack Kay before the contractor arrives at 8.45 AM. There's just not enough time for him to do all that stuff. As a result, investigators return their focus to the crime scene. We've got a house that's been broken into and signs of a burglary. The master bedroom was ransacked. The only thing that we could determine that was taken was, was some jewelry. There was a lot of things that normally would be taken in a burglary that were still there. This indicates that Kay potentially caught the intruder in the act. At that point, you have the home invasion that turned deadly. Her best friend's house next door robbed, and nobody seems to know what is going on. Everyone just wanted to know who could have done this. Police utilize a neighborhood canvas, hoping for a break. We shut down the whole neighborhood. There was one way in and one way out. And we had patrol cars and deputies there stopping every car that came in and came out. The longer you wait, then, you know, memories go bad. It becomes incumbent upon us as investigators to go out there and knock on doors and ask, hey, when you were out there in the neighborhood the other day, did you see anything around this house, or did you see anything entering or leaving the neighborhood? What do we know about the people in the area around there that could have had contact with Kay? We check our computers and everything to see, is there anybody around this area that is known for these types of crimes? You know, burglaries, break-ins, things of that nature. One name stands out, Aaron Fisher. We were able to determine that there was a person that lived in that neighborhood that I like to call a frequent flyer, because we deal with them a lot. 
He had a troubled past. He had a history of thefts and break-ins. Most burglars, they break into a residence, they steal whatever they can as quickly as possible, and then they get the hell out again. But if you're breaking into a house and the homeowner walks into the kitchen, you've got a split-second decision on your hands. Am I going to do a 10-year stint if this person calls 911, or am I going to kill her? A known criminal in Kay Parsons' neighborhood leads detectives in a new direction. You got to take every lead you can and follow up on every lead with a case like this, because right now you have a whodunit. Their suspect, Aaron Fisher, lives within sight of the Parsons' home. That person is definitely flagged, and they would examine the past records and see if that person has a propensity for committing escalating degrees of violence. I knew that he had had some issues with drugs, issues with some theft and some violence. You start by trying to nail down their time frames, you know, nail down their alibis. When questioned, Fisher tells police he was at home with his girlfriend until 10.30 a.m. that morning. We talked to her. We were able to determine that, that he wasn't involved, that he had an alibi, he wasn't there at the time. It's another dead end, meaning Kay's murderer is still at large. And there was a lot of the neighbors over there that were fearful that, you know, there was somebody out there that was doing this, and, you know, we don't know who they are yet. And so now the, the whole, you know, psycho killer out running around, that fever kind of goes out. They're scared, and particularly with a crime of this magnitude, they're double scared at that point that we don't know who he is, and he can come back and do that to me. The pressure's always there. The fear is realized through shocking news regarding Kay's neighbor. We got a phone call, said, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? And they said, um, Becky Sears just got shot. I said, do what? <laughs> There were so many twists and turns. Every time you seemed like you got a little more information and you had it figured out, boom, here comes another zinger, and it would just throw the entire story off course. Well, I went to the hospital, um, spoke with Becky at the hospital. She said she had went to work that night to do payroll because she hadn't been at work. She'd been at the hospital where Kay was. Someone came out of the bushes, and I heard what I thought was a gunshot. And I fell. He said, Is it, hey, what's his money? Or next time it would be my face. Becky said she didn't know who this person was. She never saw him before in her life and said she didn't know what he was talking about. Becky is convinced her shooting is linked to the break ins and Kay's murder. Whoever killed Kay, for whatever reason, now had a motive to kill her. It's not a coincidence, sorry. Your house gets broken into, Kay's house gets broken into. She's dead, you get shot. She was also thinking maybe it was a drug debt that Michael owed or Michael owed somebody some money. I think he's trying to stay away from, from all of that. But something about Becky's story seems off. I'm thinking, out of all the places that somebody's going to come out and shoot somebody, unless you're just that bad a shot, it's not you're not going to get shot in the lower leg or in the foot. I mean, what purpose does that serve? You get these feelings and you get these, you know, intuitions, I guess you call them. You just know something's not right. You do this job long enough and you start dealing with people, and some things that just don't add up. You notice all these little details. You got to have an answer for them. All it did was just make Becky look suspicious. I mean, because the odds of that happening, the way she said it happened, it just, that was astronomical. With suspicions growing around Becky, Detective Edmonds receives a tip. I get a phone call from one of the jailers and says there's a gentleman over there that, that wants to speak with me. So I go over to the jail and I meet with, with Jerry Jacobs. I don't know who Jerry is. 
Never talked to him in my life. The first thing you want to look at with somebody, particularly if they're in custody at the time, is what are they charged with? And are they looking to try to make a deal? I'll give you some information if you do this for me, sort of a quid quo pro kind of thing. He was there on a probation violation of a traffic ticket. So he wasn't in there for anything serious. Jerry proceeds to tell me that he is the brother of Becky Sears, who is the next door neighbor to Kay Parsons. He lived with Becky at her house for a little while, and eventually he moved out with his nephew, Christopher Bowers. Jerry tells police his sister confided in him. She came to me one day, or there in the parking lot crying, and I was like, you know, what's wrong? And that's whenever she told me she was having the affair. He goes on to tell me Becky and David Parsons, Kay's husband, having an affair and that Kay found out about the affair. I was like, hmm, because David Parsons never told me about this. I had no knowledge of an affair until that point in time right there. That kind of kind of blew my mind. So now I'm going, wait a minute. Now we got some, some motive building here. and you're putting these pieces of the puzzle together, and it's kind of starting to make sense now that, okay, this probably was a murder based on this love triangle, but was it Kay's husband that did it? Did Becky have something to do with it? Somewhere in that weird web, we got a murderer, and now we just got to figure out who, and we got to figure out how it happened. Information provided by Becky's brother, Jerry Jacobs, introduces a shocking new motive in the death of Kay Parsons. Jerry said she would call him up on the phone. She would break down. She would, you know, be hysterical, crying. He would have to talk her down. And she had asked me if I knew of anyone or if I knew a way that we could do this to kill Kay and make it look like an accident. She wanted Kay out of the way. She wanted her dead so she could have David. And then, you know, I'd be like, well, Becky, that's OK. You know, sometimes we all feel that way about people. You know, she's like, no. She's like, I really want her dead. She said, she said, can we do this? And I'm like, no, we can't. And I wanted to know why Jerry was coming forward. Why was he telling us about his sister? Jerry told me he was watching the news, and he saw about what happened at Kay's house. He said, I, can, I couldn't live with myself. If I knew this, and I knew they did it, he said, I couldn't live with myself. I don't know if it was David, if he had something to do with it. He knows some specifics about it or whatever. He's telling us stuff that, you know, at this point, we didn't know. Detectives show Jerry photographs from the scene in the hope he can provide further insight. I was like, all right, look, you know, the hammer that was used, he had seen the hammer at Becky's house. He recognized the hammer as being one that Becky had. It shows that it was definitely premeditated. You can grab a baseball bite, you can grab any sort of other implement to kill somebody, but when you bring a hammer with you as well, it shows that there was a certain degree of planning involved in the murder. Police believe that if Becky is involved, she must have had help. He told me, he said, I know who did it. I said, oh, please tell. Because you really easy to think it could be Michael, you know, the wayward son. But he told me, he said, I believe it's going to be Christopher and Becky. I can just hear them right now skimming something together and thinking they can get away with it. The accusation directs suspicion to Becky's oldest son. Christopher. He, he'd tell me, he'd like, you know, Mama called me in the middle of the night last night crying, and, you know, if she says if we could get away with it, you know, it would sure make everything better on her because she loves David so much. And then you start finding out about, about the relationship with her sons, you know, how one was the black sheep, how one she doted on, Chris was Mama's boy. He was the golden child. 
She was buying him uh, motorcycles. She rented him a house. She bought him a, a truck. She didn't do any of those things for Michael. So it was, it was a totally different relationship between those two. Christopher knew how upset she was about, about David, how she wanted to be with David. And she knew that Christopher would do anything for her. Police returned to Kay's husband, David, to confront him with the affair allegations. First thing I asked him is, tell me about the affair with Becky. Because I just wanted to blow him out of the water. I wanted him to know that I knew a lot. And it's time to come clean. Of course, when I said that, his eyes got big around his saucers. You're thinking about the husband, and would the husband have a motive to do it? He just happened to be out of town when this horrendous crime happened. But then he opened up. He started telling me all about the affair, um, how long it had lasted. Kay found out. She knew about it. You know, we talked about it. We were going to work through it. We can never stay together and to move on and move out. And he came out and said, I cut it off. And I told Kay that it was over with. What happened when you broke it off? With, with Becky, how did she take it? Well, she knew the whole time that I didn't want anything to change with my situation with Kay. I, I'm not so sure that you're telling us everything at this point. I had also told him I was going to pull his phone records and find out who he'd been talking to and what was going on. Well, he came forward then and told me that the night before the murder that, that he and Becky did talk on the phone. I called her late Monday night, I believe, and I did talk to her Tuesday. We just talked for a little while about what was going on, and, and then we got involved in, you know, phone sex that we found. Okay. And that was Tuesday night? Yes. So he's pretty much letting me know that the affair wasn't over with, like he told his wife. Is it safe to say that your words were saying no as far as the relationship, and your other communications were saying something different? Now you kind of start seeing the behind the scenes a little bit, and you start to kind of crack into the not so perfect family. So things weren't as peachy as what it seemed. It puts them further in, in it, you know? They're putting themselves further and deeper and deeper into this investigation just from not telling the truth. Detectives know he was over 2,000 miles away when his wife was killed. I knew he couldn't have committed it. He doesn't rule out that he's involved. The only people who can answer this question are Becky and Christopher. We had them in different locations, and we just went ahead and talked to them at the same time. So they didn't have a chance to get their stories together. I honestly thought that once we got in there and we talked to Chris, that he would realize that he was just a patsy. Christopher didn't say a word. Didn't ask why, what for, or anything. He refused to speak with us. Your mom's in custody, but that's right now. She is, uh, she's talking to us right now. And uh, I want you to think long and hard before you choose to go down the road. I want you to be on the right road. Whatever you're saying, I'm trying to say is a lie. When you're in this right now, I'm going to get my lawyer. I want to speak to a lawyer right now. Becky was quite the opposite. She agreed to talk to us, which surprised me. I didn't think she would. When we started confronting her about the affair with David, about what her brother had told us, she started coming forward. This is the opportunity for you to be honest and truthful and to tell me what's going on in your own words. I cared about him very, very much, and there was a time to where, yes, I thought that we would have been able to have a great relationship. And it's been over for how long? I, I can't really even say that it was ever, I mean, it's it was over, but we still talked. I told my husband and my husband told her. So she knew. She finally starts breaking down. She starts crying. And then she starts telling us it was Christopher. I told him that I that I loved David, and I should have never told Christopher that, but I did. He 
knew I was unhappy, but I didn't tell him to kill anybody. I didn't ask him to kill anybody. Convinced Christopher Bowers killed Kay Parsons, detectives continue to pressure his mother, Becky, on what she knows of the murder. Her story was that Christopher knew how upset she was about, about David, how she wanted to be with David. But she kept saying that she didn't know he was going to do it. I kept telling Christopher that I wanted to be with David, and I put this thought in his mind to do something. Becky played the consummate victim the whole way. She then makes a strange admission. On the morning of the murder, she says she picked Christopher up at 4 a.m. She couldn't answer me why. Why did you go pick him up at 4 o'clock in the morning and bring him over there? You knew what he was going to do. And she said, well, but I didn't think he would do it. It's a stunning revelation. She said she received a phone call a little bit later from Christopher saying, come pick me up. She goes down there and picks him up, and he's covered in blood. She says she asked Christopher, what'd you do? And he said, I took care of everything. I took care of it. She said, what did you do? And he said, I beat the out of her. I was so scared. She also told us about the shooting. She told us that it was Christopher that shot her. The plan was Christopher was supposed to just shoot the gun next to her so her friend could hear it. She said, yeah, he wasn't actually supposed to shoot her, which is a little poetic justice. And she said she wanted to do that so they could try to throw the investigation to try to confuse us. They now believe that while Christopher committed the act, Becky was the mastermind. You planted these seeds, you watered these seeds, you picked him up early in the morning so he could come over and reap that crop. It's remarkable because it shows the degree of control she had over him and just how much, in many ways, he actually loved his mother, that he would go along with this. We found out real quick with that interview just how conniving and manipulating that Becky actually is. I mean, because she just, she didn't care about anything other than her and her happiness and what she wanted. Becky's statement also removes any lingering doubts over Kay's husband. She swore up and down that David had, did not have any knowledge of this. He didn't know what was going to happen. He was not involved in any way. On March 27th, 2009, Becky Sears and Christopher Bowers are charged with murder. They're charged the same because they were both equally participating in the crime. If you're going to arrest somebody for something that didn't do it, they're going to scream and holler, it wasn't me, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. He didn't say a word. He was calm as he could be. The painstaking analysis of the timeline reveals exactly what happened in the last hours of Kay's life. Kay left and took her son to school. On the way to school, they stopped and got some fast food for breakfast, and then she drove back home. Knowing Kay is gone, Christopher stages his ambush. When she drove back home, she opened the garage. And then as she entered through the garage door into the foyer of the house, Christopher was lying in wait and immediately began to attack her with a hammer. She tried to fight back. She literally was fighting for her life. We could tell by the blood evidence she was able to make it to the garage, and we found a bloody handprint sliding down the garage door opener, trying to open the garage door. At some point, he switches weapons.
It was just so intense. You hear of, you know, crimes of passion. This goes beyond that. Christopher then leaves Kay near death and begins to cover his tracks. Chris then stages that burglary and then stages the one at Becky's house to make it kind of a cover. It was like a burglary gone bad. You know, maybe they won't suspect me. And then Becky received a phone call a little bit later from Christopher saying, come pick me up. She then took Christopher to her work. Then they got the phone call from Michael about the break-in, and they drove back to the house. Michael coming home, I think, was just a coincidence. Ultimately, we determined he was not involved. Christopher is the one that actually killed Kay. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind he did. And there's no doubt in my mind he did it because Becky asked him to. She's the one that manipulated her son into being a monster. I think she played on the daily routines of Kay. She knew where she was going to be, what time, when she'd be back. And so I think that she used that to her advantage to get Christopher in the house, have a game plan, and to make it easier for him to go next door and attack her. The district attorney decided to go after the death penalty for the charges. Chris never turned on Becky. Chris never would say a bad word about his mother. They both take a plea deal, and they both get life in prison without the possibility of parole. She is one of the most narcissistic people I've ever met in my life. She thought she could get away with it. There is a satisfaction there because I've heard all kinds of, you know, dang, man, you, you must be kind of, you got a crystal ball or whatever now. I just, you know, you get out there and you get on the trail and you just follow it. And, you, and, and until you get some solid answer, concrete one way or the other, you don't stop. What length would you go to to be with a person that you love? It's just a sad situation for both families. You have these children who are going to be growing up without mothers. <laughs>